insulin is the hormonal signal that promotes adipose tissue growth regardless of caloric intake. You cannot, it is absolutely impossible for a fat cell to expand uh, unless insulin is elevated. Belly fat wants to be burned. But before you skip another meal or obsessively count another calorie, stop. The reason the weight won't budge has nothing to do with willpower or discipline. It's fundamentally hormonal. I'm David Sinclair, a genetics professor at Harvard Medical School studying the biology of aging and metabolism. And what I'm presenting today will fundamentally change how you understand fat storage and weight regulation. This comes down to insulin, not calories. Insulin, the fat cell experiment that changes everything. Let me share some fascinating research that definitively demonstrates insulin's role in fat storage. Dr. Ben Bickman at Brigham Young University grows adipocytes, fat cells, in petri dishes in his laboratory. Right now, his students are cultivating these cells in incubators. These adipocytes are suspended in culture medium, saturated with calories, everything a fat cell requires, all the nutritional substrates it could possibly utilize surrounds it continuously. And yet these cells remain tiny. They're not enlarging at all, not accumulating lipids, not expanding until they add one single factor. The moment they introduce insulin into that culture medium, the fat cells immediately begin expanding. Six hours later, there's a visible lipid droplet forming. Six hours after that, it's substantially larger. Research consistently demonstrates that insulin plays the dominant role in how adipocytes store energy and drive weight gain. This means the fundamental cause of obesity isn't primarily about willpower or behavioral choices. It's largely hormonal. So if you're attempting to lose weight, obsessing over caloric restriction or forcing yourself through exhausting exercise protocols may not deliver sustainable results. The key is implementing metabolic strategies that reduce insulin levels. That's when genuine metabolic transformation begins occurring. The human proof, diabulimia, humans actually provide the most compelling evidence that you cannot accumulate adipose tissue unless insulin is elevated. One of the more common eating disorders among young individuals with type 1 diabetes is a condition called diabulimia. This is a tragic scenario where the person experiences such intense pressure to remain lean that they've learned that syringe of insulin is the absolute gatekeeper of fat cell expansion. So they deliberately underdose their insulin to maintain the body composition they desire. They can consume as much food as they want. And as long as they underdose their insulin, not even eliminating it entirely, just deliberately using a lower dose, they will remain as thin as they choose. Now there's catastrophic metabolic damage occurring. They're experiencing hyperglycemia. They're entering ketoacidosis. Their tissues are being damaged. They're literally dying, but they'll be as thin as they want. As much as people insist it's just calories in versus calories out, we have definitive human case studies that absolutely prove that model is insufficient. Insulin is the master regulator. Fasting versus the insulin trick Fasting is frequently promoted by metabolic health experts as one of the most powerful interventions available. And, and I agree, the, the research on fasting is compelling. But fasting isn't universally appropriate or sustainable. It can be challenging, requiring careful planning and substantial discipline. As a simpler, more sustainable alternative, I want to share what Dr. Bickman calls the insulin trick a set of eating habits strategically designed to naturally maintain insulin levels in optimal ranges. Many people don't realize this, but insulin is already substantially elevated first thing in the morning. This is a phenomenon called the dawn effect. The dawn effect, your morning hormonal surge. As we begin approaching waking in the morning, cortisol levels climb significantly. This serves an important physiological function. It's supposed to occur. It's natural in everyone who sleeps. A few hours before you wake, around 4 or 5 a.m., cortisol levels start rising, and they increase quite substantially. This is thought to result from the fact that as your body begins waking and your brain and nervous system come back online, the metabolic demands of your tissues rise. When cortisol elevates, it promotes the liver to begin breaking down stored glycogen and releasing it as glucose into the bloodstream. So commonly, you'll experience an elevation in blood glucose as you wake as well. This is why many people find they are measurably more insulin resistant in the morning. What I'm describing is a very common feature and why I'm inclined to state that morning represents a period of physiological insulin resistance. Why skipping dinner doesn't work. 
Even people who practice intermittent fasting by skipping dinner often observe minimal results. Here's why. The period immediately after waking is actually the highest risk time for fat accumulation. Any food you consume in the first couple of hours is substantially more likely to be stored as adipose tissue rather than oxidized for energy, thanks to that morning surge of cortisol and the resulting insulin elevation. The solution, wait it out, don't immediately rush to the kitchen. Your body naturally provides a burst of energy in the morning through that cortisol-mediated glucose release. Utilize it, plan your day, go for a walk, tackle cognitive tasks, your brain and body are actually at peak performance. Skip the sugar-laden, carbohydrate-heavy breakfast. Make your first meal a mindful, intentional event. This simple approach helps reset your metabolic signaling and establishes a healthy hormonal pattern for the remainder of the day. The simplest strategy, change breakfast. I would suggest the simplest strategy is just to change breakfast tomorrow. Overnight fasting is remarkably therapeutic. Insulin naturally declines during the fasted state, which resensitizes tissues to insulin signaling. In the morning, you've finally been fasting overnight. Insulin has decreased. The last thing you want to do is spike insulin with a starchy, sugar-laden breakfast. And tragically, breakfast has essentially become dessert in modern cultures worldwide. It's pure sugar and refined starches, pancakes with syrup, sugary cereals, pastries, orange juice, change breakfast tomorrow. That's the most impactful immediate intervention, cortisol, sleep, and appetite. Cortisol levels are intimately linked to both your circadian rhythm and stress response. When you don't obtain adequate sleep, your body interprets that as physiological stress, causing morning cortisol levels to surge, sometimes two or three times higher than normal. This spike simultaneously drives insulin elevation, making it substantially more difficult to control appetite. You experience increased hunger and reach for sugary, high-carbohydrate foods more frequently. Cortisol's metabolic effects profoundly affect the brain, where it influences appetite and food cravings. And notably, it particularly increases cravings for carbohydrates. Cortisol crosses the blood-brain barrier and binds to glucocorticoid receptors in the hypothalamus and amygdala. These are both regions critically involved in hunger signaling and reward processing. In the hypothalamus, cortisol upregulates a protein called NPY, neuropeptide Y, and another called AGRP a goody related protein. These are increased in response to glucocorticoid receptor activation, and when they're stimulated, they powerfully increase appetite. Simultaneously, cortisol inhibits leptin signaling, potentially reducing satiety. Leptin is your satiety hormone that signals stop eating. But separate from that appetite regulation in the hypothalamus, cortisol enhances dopamine release in the amygdala, thereby increasing cravings for highly palatable, energy-dense foods. You're being neurochemically driven toward calorie-dense, rewarding foods, the coffee and insulin connection. It's crucial to avoid anything at breakfast that could spike insulin, not just carbohydrates. Even coffee can be problematic. Dr. Bickman points out that caffeine can substantially raise insulin levels, especially when paired with carbohydrates. In the morning, cortisol is already elevated, actively releasing glucose into your bloodstream. Consuming coffee immediately upon waking can trigger a sudden insulin spike, even if you haven't consumed any food yet. Let me highlight a particular study uh, published approximately 20 years ago. Researchers documented the degree to which caffeine amplifies insulin secretion when someone consumes glucose or carbohydrates. When we eat carbohydrates, blood glucose levels climb and insulin must rise to reduce that blood glucose back to baseline. When you combine that carbohydrate load with high caffeine intake, you require substantially more insulin. Insulin must work considerably harder to clear the glucose from circulation. That's why I personally avoid coffee first thing in the morning. Waiting helps maintain hormonal balance and protects your metabolism from early disruption. The insulin trick, working with your hormones. At its core, the insulin trick is about understanding how your hormones behave throughout the day, and morning is the optimal time to work with them rather than against them. Later in the day, insulin patterns become less predictable and more variable depending on individual factors. So establishing the correct metabolic trajectory in the morning is critical. The dynamic relationship between cortisol and insulin profoundly influences your appetite and determines whether you're likely to overconsume calories. A strategically timed, properly composed first meal 
initiates fat oxidation and signals your body to utilize energy stores rather than accumulate them. This isn't an overnight transformation, but it's a powerful foundational step. It establishes metabolic conditions where losing adipose tissue becomes substantially easier and more sustainable without extreme deprivation or excessive effort. What to eat when you break your fast. So if you're avoiding the typical high carbohydrate breakfast, what should you consume? When you do break your fast, whether that's at 10 a.m., noon, or later, focus on protein and healthy fats. Examples, eggs prepared in grass-fed butter or ghee with avocado, full-fat Greek yogurt with nuts and seeds, uh, no sweeteners, salmon with leafy greens dressed in olive oil, grass-fed beef with sautéed vegetables. These meals provide sustained energy, maintain stable insulin levels, and don't trigger the blood glucose roller coaster that carbohydrate heavy meals create. The protein stimulates muscle protein synthesis and provides satiety. The healthy fats slow digestion, provide sustained energy, and support hormone production. And you're avoiding the insulin spike that would otherwise occur from typical breakfast foods, the complete morning protocol. Let me provide a complete morning protocol based on this insulin optimization strategy. Uh, upon waking, Drink one six twenty four ounces of water with electrolytes. Get 10 to 20 minutes of morning sunlight exposure. Engage in light movement, walking, stretching, or light calisthenics. Delay caffeine intake for 90 to 120 minutes after waking. During your fasting window, first two to four hours after waking, leverage your natural cortisol-driven energy for cognitive tasks. Maintain hydration with water or herbal tea. If desired, have black coffee after 90 to 120 minutes, not immediately upon waking. Engage in fasted exercise if appropriate for your fitness level. When breaking your fast, prioritize protein, 30-50 grams. Include healthy fats, avocado, olive oil, nuts, fatty fish. Minimize or eliminate carbohydrates in your first meal. Avoid fruit juice, sugary beverages, or high glycemic foods. Throughout the day, maintain two to three meals without snacking. Each meal should emphasize protein and healthy fats. Save any carbohydrate consumption for later in the day when insulin sensitivity improves. Finish eating at least three hours before bed. The paradigm shift. What I want you to understand is that this represents a fundamental paradigm shift in how we approach weight management and metabolic health. The calorie-centric model suggests that weight is purely about energy balance. Calories in versus calories out. Eat less, move more. Simple thermodynamics. But that model is demonstrably insufficient. It ignores the hormonal regulation of metabolism, particularly insulin's dominant role in determining whether consumed energy is stored as fat or oxidized for fuel. The insulin-centric model recognizes that hormones, particularly insulin, are the master regulators. It's not just about how much you eat, but when you eat, what you eat, and how those factors influence your hormonal milieu. Uh, when insulin is chronically elevated, fat cells are in storage mode, uh, lipolysis, fat breakdown is suppressed. You experience increased hunger, uh, your metabolism downregulates, fat accumulation is inevitable regardless of caloric restriction. Uh, when insulin is optimized, fat cells can release stored energy. Lipolysis is activated. Appetite is naturally regulated. Metabolic rate is maintained. Fat loss occurs naturally without extreme restriction. Addressing common objections. I anticipate several objections to this approach, but I need breakfast. I'm starving in the morning. That hunger is largely driven by the insulin glucose roller coaster from your previous day's eating pattern. After three to five days of implementing this protocol, morning hunger typically diminishes substantially. Your body adapts to utilizing fat stores for morning energy. Won't skipping breakfast slow my metabolism? No. Short-term fasting actually increases metabolic rate through elevated norepinephrine. It's chronic caloric restriction that downregulates metabolism. Strategic meal timing with adequate nutrition is completely different from starvation. I exercise in the morning and need fuel. Fasted exercise can actually be highly effective for fat oxidation. Your glycogen stores from the previous day are adequate for most morning workouts. If you engage in extremely intense training, you might need to adjust timing. But most people perform excellently in a fasted state. 
the evidence base. This isn't speculative. The research supporting insulin's role in obesity is extensive. Multiple studies demonstrate that insulin directly stimulates lipogenesis and fat formation in adipocytes. Research consistently shows that reducing insulin exposure through diet or fasting promotes fat loss. Clinical trials of carbohydrate restriction show greater fat loss than calorie-matched low-fat diets, despite similar caloric intake. The diabulimia phenomenon provides definitive human evidence that insulin, not calories, is the gatekeeper of fat storage. The dawn effect and morning insulin resistance are well-documented physiological phenomena described in endocrinology textbooks. The caffeine-insulin interaction has been demonstrated in controlled trials. This isn't fringe science. This is mainstream endocrinology finally being applied to practical weight management strategies. Closing thoughts. Your body wants to be lean. Adipose tissue, particularly visceral fat, is metabolically active and inflammatory. Your body would prefer to oxidize it for fuel. But chronically elevated insulin prevents that from occurring. Insulin locks fat inside adipocytes. By strategically managing insulin through meal timing and composition, particularly in the morning when insulin resistance is naturally highest. You remove that metabolic barrier. This isn't about deprivation. This isn't about suffering. This is about working with your endocrine system rather than fighting against it. Change breakfast tomorrow, delay your first meal, prioritize protein and fat when you do eat, avoid the carbohydrate insulin spike. That simple intervention implemented consistently can initiate metabolic transformation. If you found this valuable, share it with someone struggling with stubborn weight despite doing everything right. This hormonal perspective might be the missing piece they need. This is Dr. David Sinclair from Harvard Medical School. Your leanest, most metabolically healthy years can still be ahead of you.